And my um, attitude is, I want to know what's happening in the world. I want to know what's going on so that we can do something about it. And I, I, I have this passion to know what's going on just because I want to know what's going on as well. And um, so I'm going to pursue um, any area that justifies itself to me that it needs to pursuing. And um, what people make of that is entirely up to them. Sure. I've been pretty taken aback, to be honest, as I've gone around the world um, talking about this in the last few uh, weeks. In London, Czech Republic, Spain, Lisbon, America, etc. Um, I've been taken aback at how many people have gone, well, it sounds amazing, mate, but actually what the way you... You, you, you've explained it, it makes perfect sense. Uh, because we accept things as they are, often because they were like that when we were born. And we tend to think, well, this is how life is, this is what it is, it's the moon, mate, isn't it? But when you start pursuing these things, where you say, okay, um, let's ask some questions about it, <clears throat> uh, and, and you, you, you realize that what seems to be straightforward, like it's a moon, and it's a moon, mate, is actually nothing like straightforward. You also realize, and I, I found this with, um, with so many areas of my research in the scientific field, that so much of what is accepted scientific fact, when you play it back into where it came from, turns about out to be someone's theory, which through constant repetition is accepted as fact. Yeah, right. And so, <clears throat> um, the question I, 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 I looked at was, was where did the moon came from, come from or where, where is it perceived to have come from? And if you asked um, a mainstream scientist, he'd probably say um, a Mars-type planet came along, smacked into the Earth when it was forming. It, a, a chunk went away, uh, broke off and became the moon. Uh, and that's known as the Big Whack Theory or the Whack Theory. Um, but then that didn't make uh, sense um, through physics and various other things. So they had to um, uh, get their quart into a pint pot, like a big fat man trying to get into a you know pair of trousers too small. We've got to make this fit, okay? Right. Okay, now, okay, now, <coughs> just, just, just put some elastic in. Put some elastic in the trousers, okay? Now yeah. everyone pull. Hey, oi, click, yeah. it, he's in. Yeah. See? It's true. See? That's yeah. what it's like, yeah. see? That's yeah. what it's like. No, yeah. no, no. That's not the size of trousers that man should be wearing. You've just forced him into them. Yeah. And it's the same with the thing about the moon, because when the, when the whack theory didn't work out, they came up with a double whack theory, which yeah. is that the, the, the Mars-type planet hit the Earth and then came back and had another, another smack at it. The old one, too. Um, and, and, and then you look at other areas. I mean, putting it in simple terms, they have no idea where the moon came from. No. And then when you pursue it even <clears throat> more, you find that um, scientists have said over the years that one, for instance, that the only thing you can say for certain about the moon is its observational error. It's not really there, because it shouldn't be there. It's far, far too big, um, over 2,000 miles across, uh, um, far too big to be a satellite of a, of a planet the size of the Earth where I'm, with our magnetic field. Um, and uh, then there comes the evidence, which I, I, I put in the book and talk about in the, in the events, that... that um, that, it, that it's hollow, not, not completely hollow, but to a very large extent hollow. Um, and how when they've smacked it with, um, with, with, with missiles um, to, uh, uh, where they, after they've put seismometers on the moon, they've whacked it with, with, with objects of, 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 of massive impact. And they found that, uh, to, um, to quote one scientist at NASA, the moon rang like a bell. Yeah, yeah, right. And, there was no <clears throat> reason why it should do that unless it was hollow. Yeah, right. And so I, I go into this, and I'm still pursuing it, but um, there's something fundamental about the moon um, which uh, is not the story that we've been given. And I, my, my suggestion um, is that the Earth is being controlled in terms of our perception from the moon. And interestingly, when I, I then took it to the next stage and started looking at... Um, ancient legends and accounts and beliefs about the moon, um, it all synced with, with that same um, idea because the Zulu people, for instance, in Africa, they say that the moon uh, only came here, uh, quote, hundreds of generations ago. And they symbolize it as an egg. Yeah, yeah, right. And of course, when 
modern anthropologists go along or whatever and they say, oh, these people say the moon's like an egg or is an egg. They say, oh, these are primitive people, you know. But what they're doing, and the reason they say symbolize it as an egg, is because they say it was hollowed out. Yeah, right. Um, which again <coughs> fits this whole theory. Uh, in in um, 1970 or the early 1970s, two scientists from the Soviet Academy of Sciences uh, wrote a, a detailed article in a, a Russian magazine saying that the, the, the moon is not um, a heavenly body, not a natural body. And they said that it was a hollowed out planetoid probably. And interestingly, um, there are um, um, various metals, etc., that have been found on the moon that have never been found in a natural environment. Uh, they, they, they are created. And um, that one scientist said that the moon is inside out. What's on the outside should be on the inside, which again fits in with this hollowed out planetoid thing. And, you know, when you look at um, the, um, the Star Wars movies, where they had the concept of the um, Death Star, which, you know, was kind of a moon, it looked yeah, like a moon. Mm -hmm. But actually, it was it was not a, a, a natural body. It was constructed, and when when you're dealing with people like George Lucas, the producer of um, the Star Wars movies, who is a massive insider, um, a lot of these so-called science fiction uh, movies, etc., not least things like The Matrix, come from a uh, an understanding of the way things are, uh, and they're based on fact, not fiction, and. For me, um, we're looking at a, um, a situation where uh, the moon was brought here. When it came, um, because of its effect on the earth, uh, it created um, geological catastrophe, which is um, detailed in all ancient accounts all over the world. Right. They talk about <clears throat> the time when the earth turned over, which of course, something like the moon coming in, it would make the earth uh, turn over. I the mean, extra... Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the moon is uh, fundamental in the um, angle that the earth is at and the speed that it spins. So just by being there without anything else, and I think there's a lot more else which I talk about, um, it's having a fundamental effect on, on human life, our perception of time, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, the seasons. The seasons are, are, are in effect created by the, the, the influence of the moon. It has massive effects on, um, on, on the water of the earth, and we are 60-70% water. It has um, a massive impact on the hormonal system, including things like the pineal gland um, and the pituitary gland, which together um, make up what people call the third eye, the sixth sense. Um, so it, it's having a massive effect just by being there yeah. on life on Earth. And, yeah, and what I'm no, saying is that actually th there's, there's stuff coming from the moon which, um, which is affecting our ability to perceive reality on the scale that there were before. I, I'm using the, the analogy, and it's beyond an analogy really, um, it's very much uh, the theme that if you um, look at the World Wide Web, the, the internet, it's a collective reality. Right. And uh, in places like the Netherlands or Britain or America or wherever, you go on the internet and you can pretty much, pretty much go everywhere on the internet that, and, and, and explore that entire reality. But if you're in China, the internet's been firewalled off. So yeah. there's vast tracts of the internet, the collective reality, that they can't perceive, they can't access. Yeah. Um, what I'm saying is the effect of the moon, uh, not just its... If, uh, if you like physical presence, but what's coming from the moon uh, is acting like a firewall, like a hack. And what humans could perceive before in terms of the breadth and scale of reality, they're not perceiving now. And this is one reason, perhaps a major reason, why the frequency range of human perception on, on the so-called physical level is, is, is beyond a fraction. I mean, according to uh, mainstream science, um, of the mass matter uh, that exists in this universe, visible light um, is, is almost imperceivable. I mean, even the whole electromagnetic spectrum is said to be about 0 
0.5% of what there is in this universe. And visible light, of course, is, is, is a, a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So what we're perceiving in terms of what there is to perceive in this, in this universe is, is fractional. Yeah. And I'm saying that that is not how it used to be. We used to have a much greater breadth and expansion of, of, of what we could perceive. And, and I'm saying that there's so much so-called out there that we're not seeing that is out there. And maybe there's things we are seeing that are not out but there. Somebody put it there then in order to control it. Yes, they, exactly. Exactly that. This is, what I'm, this is what I'm saying. Exactly that. And, you know, if people find it, it, it hard to believe that, um, that, that frequency fields, for instance, coming from the moon, and I'm talking about technological know-how that's kind of light years beyond what, what, what we perceive as possible. Um, and, 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 and that um, those frequencies are suppressing our ability to perceive what we normally perceive. Well, I was reading a mainstream science magazine um, a few months ago called New Scientist in Britain. And it was saying that um, since America switched from analog television to digital television, astronomers have been able to see for the first time in modern times, probably the first time ever given the technology they've needed to be developed, um, whole galaxies in a frequency range that they couldn't see before and that there was a race against time to, to, to see as, and, and gather as much information as they could before those f former analog TV frequencies were sold off to mobile phones uh, companies and other people uh, that, that, that would fill that band again and, and, and shut out all those galaxies. Now, let's just think about that. Even on the, the level, and compared with the, the level I'm talking about, even on the level of the Stone Age technology that we have com in comparison to what's possible, astronomers could not see whole galaxies because Americans were watching the television. <laughs> right? Now, you take that <coughs> onto the technological level that I'm talking about and the idea that um, uh, our perception possibilities can be blocked um, becomes, uh, you know, obviously possible.